That's buttoned up. All right, everybody, we are live on Facebook in the Systemic Frog group and the Systemic Frog page. Welcome. My name is Dawn Jensen. I'm one of the moderators and administrators here for Systemic Frog, and I wanted to um, wanted everybody to introduce themselves. We have a couple of things that we're going to talk about tonight and talk about Systemic Frog as a, a body, a community of practice, and um, a community of engagement, and what we should expect next. So Matt versus Matthew. Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Matt and um, I, I'm in Systemic Frog. I'm a business enterprise architect by trade. So I do a lot of systemic stuff for organizations, big and small, um, far and wide. Um, and in a lot of industries, really. So I'm, I'm very British in addition to being Welsh. And this presidential election, is a big thing over here, so I'm very interested to find out what's going on. <laughs> I'm curious well, which comes like... first, British or Welsh? Ah, <laughs> uh, Welsh probably. Well, well let, depending let, on the lately being depending Welsh on... is a bit of a chore. <laughs> I am the other Matthew uh, uh, Witt, uh, pleased to be included um, with esteemed friends and colleagues here. I am a professor in Southern California, and um, if I'm an urbanist by academic training and other things, and um, sort of a critical urbanist, I guess, and that's what um, catches my attention to the likes of uh, Don and Matt and our compatriots in Systemic Frog. So very glad to be included. Fantastic. So I would like to, I, I know that we're kind of monitoring what's been going on in the political scene, but I'd like to get an idea of um, the, the origination, the idea behind Systemic Frog, what who we are kind of our tenants what we stand for and um what we're looking to do collectively as a community well the, i'll i'll that for that I've, I've not really told the full story of this um i guess now is the time to start i'll be looking to make um a little bit of an edited video um with my personal background and story leading up to the idea of frog um and maybe stick it on YouTube uh, as, as well as other stuff, other places where it might get left alone. But essentially, um, around 2012, 2013, I was full on consulting in London, working for multinationals, um, proper, you know, 15, 18 hour days, long commutes. Uh, I, I guess your equivalent would be, you know, the, the New York, LA lifestyle, that kind of thing. Maybe not so much LA, Matt, but. Uh, you know new york on the on the d train that kind of thing um yeah. you know it was proper pro proper um uh me metaphorical existence really uh you know six years of being caught up in a dream and um i went to one 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 event at the time the the, the company that i had uh was called pro virtua and was very much uh the organizational construct kind of company doing the architectures for these com uh, these organizations, the big ones. I went to an event in Marlebone, um, uh, an award event uh, through colleagues and friends. One, one, one of the girls that we knew was um, being honored at this thing for being like, um, she, she was the outgoing young person of the year in business. And she, uh, by requirement, handed over the prize to this year's winner. Well, that was 2014, and at this event, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give names and faces out of it, but one, one of the keynote speakers turned out to be the latest inductee to the Club of Rome. And, you know, I, I'd heard of the Club of Rome. I knew a bit about them, um, but I'd never actually had it made real before. You know, these, these are one of the things you hear about Bilderberg and the Club of Rome and all these kind of frameworks, Davos, on the news, and, uh, you know, that was reach. So anyway, this, this, this guy talked about his experiences uh, in joining the organization, um, what it meant, how it implied, the implications it had on his own business, and the fact 
aspects in the context of the event we were at. And the language was very interesting, very curious, got me thinking. Um, you know, he talked about the integrity of business and how businesses have a responsibility to transform the world. And, you know, made it very clear that there was some kind of transformation in effect. Although back then, I mean, we were talking, you know, six, seven years ago, whilst you pick up on these inferences, you, you, you never see any, any kind of holistic picture. So it was, it was an interesting speech with a lot of loose ends. And I started looking into those loose ends. And the more I looked, the more that picture coalesced. And, you know, being involved with the architectural side of multinationals, you, you, you figure out how they work. A lot of it's stakeholder management. You figure out how the, the big boys in these organizations think, act, want in terms of outcomes, um, both in their own careers and for the organization. And it got me thinking that, you know, what, what we needed really is some kind of early warning system to figure out what was going on. Because it was clear back then that the, the media were in, implicated. That, uh, you know, there was a certain element of orchestration going on. So I, I changed Pro Virtua ultimately to Systemic Frog. I'm still very much on the consultancy tip. Uh, very very organizational born of the metaphor of the boiling frog so anybody's heard of this before um, the myth is that if you have a frog in a saucepan full of water and very slowly incrementally turn the heat up the frog is unaware of the danger that it's in well ultimately boil to death that's invariably untrue um, some sociopaths tested the theory and invariably the frog jumps out of the saucepan so it's a, it's a good little metaphor to try and indicate the difference between in, implied and implicit belief on behalf of others and being able to provide what in the trade we call the, the the level of requisite variety of information that's getting the right information to the right people at the right time to be able to act in or react preferably act to um, circumstances that might affect them. Um, so Systemic Frog was born as a name. You know, and since then, I've met some wholesome and very interesting people along the way. <laughs> you know, and for the last year, 18 months, we've been having a bit of a chat, trying to scope what's going on. Oh, Dan's, Dan's arrived this guy. And, um, you know, we're, we're getting to the point now where we have a workable framework, workable epistemologies, um, a viable approach, and I mean viable in the actual sense of the word, not as the UN uses it, a sustainable approach, <laughs> um, to try and be a little bit more rigorous in exploring exactly what the world's events mean what whys and hows, and maybe provisioning a little bit of common sense as the world seemingly intends to go start raving bonkers. I mean, tonight might actually prove a good example of that. Who knows? <laughs> but, you know, you've got to have a sense of humor about these things. Um, inject a little bit of humor. There might be a little bit of dark happy along the way. But, um, you know, it's, it's about the reveal. It's about trying to be honest, freely speaking, not afraid to have an opinion, not afraid of the, the circumstances that surround, might surround oneself having given an opinion and being able to offer up that opinion for discourse, debate and one would hope being able to form a consensus through doing so with like minds who know what they're doing, which for me would make a nice change. <laughs> and there we go, that's Systemic Frog. Um, we're non-profit, everything monetary that comes our way goes back into the organization um, in terms of access to 
resource knowledge uh, to round off what we're trying to do. Um, I believe Professor Witt, yourself, coined the phrase instead of a great reset. One of the attentions would, would be to try and scope, make real and develop the great redress. Um, the reasons and motivations behind that are being slowly made clear through our content on Medium, YouTube and Facebook. So that's the interesting academic exercise. And other, than, other than that, we're just having the chat and trying to figure things out. How's that? That sounds great. Hi, Deb. <laughs> hey, welcome. Top of the morning to everyone. All right, so we've done our basic introductions. Um, did you want to hop on and say hello and who you are, where you're from, what you do? Are we live? We are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Infamous at last. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> Your Ernie cup. <laughs> well, my uh, there goes my, my Elmo cup is uh, at the office. Um, oh, Elmo, yeah. I I just got up uh, not too long ago, so greetings from the uh, southern, sunny southern parts of Japan. Uh, my name is uh, Dan. Uh, Dan Brody. I've uh, been in Japan for about 25 years now. I work at a local university. I specialize in uh, rhetoric, uh, classical rhetoric, and uh, linguistics. So uh, I'm, I guess I'm interested mostly in uh, a politi uh, political discourse, public discourse, and trying to understand. Uh, how powerful people, organizations, institutions lie, how they deceive the uh, public. So nice to nice to see everyone. I'm still. I might. I probably have to apologize. I'm feeling a little bit groggy. I I, I haven't even had any coffee. So uh, great to see everyone. <laughs> I, I think you're quite okay. I mean, we've got the UK, we've got here in Central Florida and, and California recognized. So we're, we're kind of um, in various stages. I think Matt's about, you know, he's on his 10th cup of coffee at the moment. Nice. <laughs> so yeah. Cal, in the house. 2, 2, 2 a.m. nearly here. Um, so. so, whoa. Matthew, I wanted to. Um, get a little back, bit of background from you and, and kind of how you came to Systemic Frog and what what sparked your interest in in this conversation, in this community. I, it, it was, thanks, Don. It wasn't revealed to me until fairly recently that, that you know, Matt's been stalking me for some time. So I, 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 that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, and, you know, I think were it not for him lurking my Facebook page, I, I would have missed this remarkable opportunity. Um, he and I got to exchanging uh, back when um, in Facebook in a community there that had a couple of distinctive sort of vocal hubs. And that's back when Facebook was really popping about, well, it's been a few years ago now, at least three years, I think Matt was about, about then. And um, I was so intrigued to uh, have a crowdsourcing of critical media and opinion uh, that I was um, lurking myself on Facebook quite a bit. And um, it, it felt quite vibrant and it, it was high frequency and there was no um, uh, whatever Facebook would be doing um, increasingly to throttle down feeds across this community um it was lively and uh that's you know and then I, I i was keeping track of matt too and um and his his provocative uh, commentaries and then some and then you start to get these overlapping venn diagram of communities and it's uh, you know people you know someone who knows someone 
who knows someone you know very well, and all of a sudden you've got this interesting linkage, uh, this sort of ramifying network um, in, in virtually, and, and that was that. In terms of continuing then, I, it's just, it's gone from interesting to really intriguing. Uh, so Matt has shared a little bit about the origins of Systemic Frog. Um, there's, there's more to tell there. I don't know for what time we have tonight and what all we want to get to. It's a, you know, a historic night, as it were. It's a historic night every four years, but people want to attribute to this one a, a real whopper of a, a historic night. Um, speaking of which, so my comment, now the news that I'm getting, the, the stuff that I'm looking at streaming is saying, you know, it's remarkably quiet out there in spite of all of the fervor that there were going to be riots and, and you know, violence in the streets. So we might take that up, um, for which I'm very pleased. Uh, so, gosh, I just, there's so much, right, that we've talked about and so much we can continue to talk about. I think I'm going to yield to Dan because he's always got something very, very interesting on the tip for us. No oh. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you hadn't done that so quickly. I was just about to ask my daughter to grab some coffee for me. <laughs> We, we can absolutely cover for you for the time. So if you want to just do that, that would be great. Um, I think one of the things we want to do is is kind of go through the intention for today, this evening. Yeah, this is the first milk. foray into, you know, wow. we've had conversations on Skype. We've recorded ideas. There's um, a number of things that are being published and, and thought of in, in, in the community. And there's strong beliefs in and around um, you know the tenants and the principles that we hold dear. So I think you know I want to be mindful of our time and um, for those that are interested in going in the long haul we want to be able to do that as well. So hard stops. Um, I think Matthew you have a hard stop today tonight. I do sorry I mic because we're getting some feedback. Um, yeah, around 6.30, so I wish I could stick. Okay. Yeah, around about 45 more minutes. Perfect. You will have run out of everything I had to say in far less time, but um, yeah. Can, it's can, can, can I ask everybody a question? Mm. As, as, a, as a horrible colonial, um, it's the US election today. So with talking to people with a vested interest, um, three-part question. If, if you were to reveal your preference, I guess, who do you want to win? Uh, who do you think should win? And who do you think will win? Because I'm betting that they're gonna be at least two different answers to, to, to two of those three questions. Such, want, such is the circumstance. Want, should, will. Is that it? So I can... Uh, yeah, so, you know, who, who, who would you vote for if you were going to vote? I mean, I can play, neither. I can play then as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I say uh, neither. I want neither to win. Um, who should win? Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on who's rigging this. Um, and, and that's related to who will win. I'm sorry to be so cynical and jumped out on hysterical conspiracy, uh, but I look at the numbers. I don't really think about conspiracies as much as the numbers and all that are in place uh, that have been there for some time with um, uh, the electronic voting and the proprietary um, arrangements made with Diebold and other now vendors in the field yeah. for that. And the, the, it's extraordinary to think that there would be any kind of proprietary contracts for under what conditions they could disclose the, the data uh, determining a democratic election, but there it is. Um, no, so it's, it's a trend. It's a trend that we share, we share. I mean, we're seeing similar things with Serco in the UK, Matt. Okay, Matt. I, no, no big surprise. I, I want, should, will. I love, love the three part. Um, um, sh uh, should win. Um, 
again, it's sort of, it's a multifaceted, you know, should win according to what um, sort of agendas and, and what sort of purposes who will win all almost certainly Biden will win. In my, in my opinion, almost certainly the narrative is simply is been too fluffed up uh, uh, to permit um, a Trump win that it, it, it's, it's too, a Trump win would be too much in contrast with the expectations for the should and the wants of your, uh, the first part um, to clash too much with the, with the will. That's how I see it. I'm looking for Don's take. Your mic's off. I said it all there. Look <laughs> <laughs> sick as ever. My, uh, so my candidate's not not on board. Um, yeah, I, I'm a big Tulsi fan. I actually like Elizabeth Warren. Um, and it's it's been a struggle to see the ineptitude of, of, I think, aspects of both parties um, play on the sincerity of, of public opinion. And um, and you have one candidate who is just, I mean, belligerent at best. He's a maverick in every sense of the word. You have another one that is, is tried and true, wants to um, die in the wool Democrat. So, you know, if I was looking at just my area um, and everything that I've I've seen in the last four or five days, then I would definitely tell you that Trump's a winner. I don't know that that's going to happen, but I think for with everybody in and around me, it's uh, and when I say they are, and it's not military, it's passionate. They're so passionate about a uh, Trump win. Um, oh. It's a fever pitch. It's been a fever pitch for the last three or four days, coming up into early voting to you know today. Uh, that's really interesting. I I think what you say about the passion. I don't hear any passion for Biden in the liberal circles that I am in in Claremont, California, and among the universe crowd. Uh, I, I don't hear any passion. I hear dire dire worry for a, tr a perpetuation of Trump, but but no love for Biden or Harris. Hmm. What about you, Dan? Well, um, I've thought about this question <clears throat> over the past number of months, uh, and I've always concluded that we're uh, offered a false alternative, false choices. <laughs> either seems to be either uh, Beelzebub or the Antichrist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would like to see uh, Howie Hawkins, the Green Party. But, uh, you know, in, in observing from afar, it doesn't, doesn't appear that Howie Hawkins is on any ballot. Um, I would have liked to have seen Tulsi Gabbard. Um, she would she was probably my number one uh, but you know I think uh, the whole system has been captured people have been talking about this for a while it's, I don't think it's anything new to say that uh, yeah. the the politics has been captured uh, so whomever we whomever wins the uh, the executive office um, I think we'll see uh, more of the same. If Biden wins, perhaps a, an acceleration of the globalist agenda. If Trump wins, perhaps a delay of the what seems to be the inevitable. Good point. To, to Dan's to Dan's uh, take, I have thought for some time that the last time we had a president there for our purposes. Uh, I would characterize him as a hostage n negotiator for the public interest, uh, and that was John F. Kennedy. And the public interest was, as it was us, the hostage. And the issues were um, Cold War and nuclear annihilation. And his a speech at American University signed his epitaph. 
And um, that was it. It since then, we may disagree, Dan, on at what point the tilt was complete. But a military industrial and now a infotech, biotech mm. industrial of the complex um, is cinching up. The internet mm. of bodies is here. Mm. Uh, the behavioral economy is within a year away kicking in. We already have derivative markets in kindergarten performance. Um, according to uh, Alison McDowell's astonishing um, you know, sort of on the ground investigative journalism, mm. uh, which she substantiates very carefully um, with her sources. Yeah. Uh, once you can chip everyone into big data, you've got markets on, on all sorts of outcomes. And I'm not being flip when I say literally there's already been a, a derivative actions in, uh, taken in the case of school children, kindergarten age, and what the likelihood is of their successful um, completion of some program of study for them. Uh, because their data has been is now in the in the loop, I have to go back and find. You know, we can do this again. We'll find sources. The broader point is uh, a behavioral economy, a behavioral economy that will make what we associate with China look uh, very rinky-dink. China has been a, been a right advanced in behavioral economy in some ways with their sort of behavioral indicators of social um, conduct. But what's being talked about and what's being laid in place is quantum levels beyond what we associate even with China's policing of, you know, brownie points for good behaviors. So, hmm. yeah. Well, that, that, that's interesting. I mean, I, I think I can draw a straight line through most of the stuff that, that you guys have said there. From an outsider's perspective, um, which quite frankly at the moment I'm quite enjoying considering the circumstances. But, um, I mean, Matt, you mentioned JFK and that which came after him. And, you know, I know you and I have spoken about Lyndon Johnson in quite some length. And, you know, I think the public perspe per perception over those circumstances are, are quite tentative with regards to having to reconstruct their own personal worldviews and nobody likes to do that right and you know you, you'd skirt around the the details of that circumstance if you had any kind of common sense but you know we, we see the same sort of thing happening in the uk around john major i mean john major was our lyndon b johnson you know when, when they managed to get rid of thatcher for whatever reasons whether you agreed with thatcher or not you know, the Maastricht Treaty and circumstances that surrounded that, the cabinet revolts, um, John Major's um, ultimate succession of Thatcher, um, you know, and then on to involvement through the UK government directly with um, the guys at Davos and Bilderberg, and the Club of Rome, the Carlisle Group, and all those usual suspects. You know, I, I think it does demonstrate further than indicate that you know the UK system is being subverted as well as the US um, arguably by the same guys so you know we're both in that boat albeit the UK coming 30 years after the US you know and I think I think that is telling because you know Tulsi Gabbard for me was by far the most credible candidate of either party <clears throat> by by a head and a nose uh, right up until when she wasn't you know the, the commit the capitulation that she showed when Bernie folded was wholesale disappointing for me yeah. as a as a witness to the DNC process um, and I, I may even use that in a, in a legal term <laughs> I mean for, for a Brit you know looking at how the DNC conduct, conducts themselves during their selection process is quite frankly mind-boggling. Um, you know, borderline fraudulent, or actually literally fraudulent probably. 
Oh. It's in keeping with the trend, though, right? Say it. It's in, it's in keeping with the trend from the last general election. Yep. Well, absolutely. When you know, Bernie pulled the same trick twice. You know, right. under under Obama and um, uh, sorry, under Hillary Clinton and um, mm. under Joe Biden. And you know, whereas the first time around it was probably a shock to a lot of people, I think the second time around it certainly wasn't a surprise. Mm. I mean, Bernie's played his role. Right. Um, he certainly lost a fan in me because of it the first time around. Right. Yeah. But you know, Gabbard ran the danger of doing the same thing. I, I think in Bernie, she was trying to motivate him to you know one last push which he failed to deliver and therefore gabbard was left exposed and you know politically i can understand why she withdrew from the race um in the sudden circumstances that she did but it's not going to do her any favors the next time around and that that's the disappointment for me um you know i, I think from a perspective of integrity the the u.s process now in spite of um, it being hijacked by actors, quote unquote. Um, you know, it requires that one participant to, you know, be unwielding. And I, I thought that Gabbard was that candidate, and you know, it turns out she wasn't. I think she's got to do a bit of bridge building for the next time around if she's going to be involved because of that. And I hope she does in the right way. Because I, I, I thought, you know, even if Bernie had become the candidate, Gabbard was a shoe in for foreign secretary because her, her foreign policy rocks. Um, you know, but as soon as people started talking about a Gabbard Sanders ticket rather than a Sanders Gabbard ticket, you know, I, I don't think that helped her cause. I mean, in a little bit, she was too good. <laughs> you know? right. She uh, she brought herself to the attention of too many people, even though purportedly she she only had single figure percentages on the polls, which, quite frankly, I don't you know doesn't wash with me. But yeah, you, you know, and and then you see uh, Matt going back to the the, the second point you made um, via, via Dan and Dawn. Um, you know, you end up with Biden. Uncle Fluffy himself, um, which is un unfathomable for for an outsider who looks to the USA to be, you know, that epitome of democracy. You know, Biden is the archetypal puppet. Um, yeah. You know, not not only that, but his campaign is run on a slogan of "Build Back Better," which just happens to be the same as Boris Johnson's, same as Macron's. Same as Trudeau's, you know, by anybody's definition of an element of translation. Um, these these slogans are demonstrably rooted in the Great Reset, which can only lead one to believe, or conclude even, <clears throat> based on yes. the evidence presented, and we go back to the requisite variety of information again, that all these guys are linked to the same group, there has been an element of orchestration. Yeah. And in that case, if Biden wins, what you are voting for is probably 300 years of human strife. Because I think, I think that the outcome of the Great Reset, if impl Im implemented, um, yeah. behavioral economies, yeah. um, the, the, the technocratic rule, yeah. the, the sanctions imposed if one does not subscribe to a totalitarian state. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm actually trying not to sound urgent, <laughs> but you know, I, I believe that right now is very parallel and very similar to what Germany must have been like in 1933. And you know, the, there is a, a lesson, or if not lessons. And a lot of them to be learned from history here. So, yeah, if I was voting in the US election, Biden would be the last person I would vote for. Trump would probably be the second last person I would vote for <laughs> <laughs> because I also think he's mental. Um, Dan, the, the guy you mentioned, the Green Party guy, is the only person I believe to actually publicly state that he's against mandatory vaccinations. 
mm. and has some kind of robust position on health policy, uh -huh. um, which I feel from the, the limited exposure I've had to him um, is very much rooted in current events and good on him yeah. for yeah. putting his head above yeah. the parapet. I mean, he, he would be a candidate for me in the absence of Gabbard. Sure. But, you know, I, I can't play, so that's that. Um, you know, I've okay. had interesting stuff of Brexit and and then everything that's come come before and after it in in the UK. So, you know, I've, I've already uh, had had my little crisis with regards to electoral democracy. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I, I, I think, you know, in light of Biden's campaign mirroring um, countries that are quite demonstrably implicated in uh, being driven by the WEF, the IMF and the UN, um, with an eye on 2030 sustainability and everything that comes with it. Um, I don't think Biden can be allowed to lose this. Um, I, th I think if it was if it was allowed to run its course naturally, Trump would probably win by a ratio of 70-30. I've seen nothing to demonstrate that Biden has any kind of credibility other than he is not Trump. You know, he's he reacts rather than acts. Uh, the man's got no courage. Um, you know, no, no radical ideas or otherwise. I mean, I, I don't know. He's got an idea in his campaign group other than the manifesto he's been given to implement. So yeah, I mean, how they're going to rig a twenty percent difference is the fascinating component for me in this particular exercise. You know, because making it a 51% win for Biden, it's going to take a lot of effort. And I, I think, um, you know, Diebold and, I mean, we've had this demonstrated as fraudulent process in terms of electronic voting, you know, in Florida, in Ohio, in other parts of the US since That's Bush. Right. That's right. Yeah. You know, and it's still right. going on. That's it's right. still being allowed to go on. Right. Yeah. And, you know, may, maybe they've got it down to the fine art where a 20% margin can be closed now. Uh, the mailing votes, I think, is another one. I, I, I've been saying this to, I think Dawn and I had a conversation about it earlier on in the week. Um, you know, from an outsider, and bear in mind, if, you know, if, if, if you're watching this, Trump and Biden are completely unviable candidates for me. I mean, the thought of either one of them being the US president next year, it's horrifying to me. Mm. Um, so when I say that this little issue over the post office, you know, all we ever got in the UK with regards to exposure to news is how Trump is trying to subvert the mail-in process to stop Biden winning the presidency. Mm. Now, systemically, there is an argument to be put forward that Trump may be knowing the, the corruption and the techniques employed by the DNC was trying to consolidate control over the post office to A, try and make it a fair fight and stop Biden rigging mailing votes to bump up his share and Trump being Trump, maybe give himself a little bit of help along the way. You know, but we don't see any of that in the UK. I mean, one wonders why. I mean, would, were you seeing any of that in the in the U.S. or, as usual, was the U.S. media putting forward a completely different perspective than wow. that which the U the U.K. media represented about the U.S.? How did you find, did it, you find it, Matthew? So I I've been a bit derelict, uh, folks, in closely monitoring, but I I have not. I what I've picked up is generally so. You know, what the what the system players require is le legitimation of the process, and any person in a position of power who questions the process too directly, or you know too seriously, or with too much gravitas, um, you know has to be neutralized. That message must be neutralized, um, it, it, unless it's Russia, uh, and and Russia, and of course all, all again right all things Russia are linked to most things Trump. And so the Russia tag that was 
you know, a dead letter upon any basic media um, uh, um, integrity scrutiny, um, as if those go together, for the most part, they don't, um, you know, found to be utterly without, uh, but most specious substance when it was Russiagate was rolling out, um, you know, continues to play. It continues to be tagged. It continues to be inserted. It continues, you know, so that kind of uh, inference and wild speculation, Matt, is, uh, is, is, is there and in, it's in play, but that's all I've seen. And, and it, and it, as well, it adds up because that fits a narrative of, of America Uberalis and Russia struggling to uh, uh, subvert uh, um, that, um, you know, hegemony and that virtue and that destiny, right? That end of history destiny that uh, America is meant to fulfill on the world stage. And uh, yeah, so I haven't picked up and I'm, nor am I surprised. I'd be more surprised about that kind of inflammatory stuff that would delegitimate the process. They need the process legitimated, uh, but for some this or that very bracketed, very controlled, very framed, very groomed, um, positioning. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Plenty of examples of, uh, what Matthew is talking about here, um, how people are, uh, sort of, I would use a metaphor kind of like filtered out. People are filtered out of the process or the public discussion. Uh, when they uh, question, publicly question the official narratives. Uh, right. You saw that with the, for example, uh, there are many examples. One that immediately comes to mind is the example of the collection of doctors, physicians, frontline physicians who come out and talk about the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine Yes, <clears throat> as an effective, uh, effective yes. remedy and prophylactic for the yes. treatment of uh, COVID. Yes. And uh, you see uh, these people either ignored completely in the mainstream media or uh, yes. castigated by the mainstream media. And the only place that you can see reasonable discussions are the, these, you know, the independent sources you have to you really want to understand the world, uh, you have to first grasp the fact that we're all being propagandized. Yes. And uh, we're, yeah. as they say, um, we're contributing to our own uh, brainwashing. If we continue to engage with these mainstream sources. Uh, so if you want to any kind of reasonable discussion, you have to uh, engage with alternative sources. Uh, Matthew was talking about, uh, Matthew referenced um, uh, McDowell. Uh, she has an amazing blog. Uh, I yeah. think it's Wrench in the Gears. Yes. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The, those kinds of uh, sources, uh, journalists, are yeah. incredibly important to uh, helping the masses to open their eyes to what's really unfolding all around them. She's got an interview where, I mean, she's like the Oracle for reals, the matrix Oracle for reals sitting down being talked to as a, as getting started in the public schools uh, with concerns about, you know, funding and the lack thereof and the increasing privatization through vouchers and following out of sort of effective mm -hmm. public deployment of education. She's got started following her nose and her, her love for her child or concern for a child. And it was from there that she launched forward. And so she has her take on the fourth great industrial revolution. And she does, it's, it's astonishing what she does in very little space of time mm. to sync up and, and link points quite vividly. Mm. Uh, and, you know, she's like, she's like what Jane Jacobs did to urban renewal. You know, it's the death and life of great American fantasies of its freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, uh, yeah, Dan, I, I just came across her recently and, um, it's so disappointing then also, right. She was in an exchange on a Rutgers platform with Naomi Klein, 
you may have had it. Um, and Naomi Klein, when Naomi Klein realizes where she's going with her claims about her dubiousness about the second wave, uh, Naomi, Naomi just jumps on her and says, look, we're on a platform of Rutgers students. I think it would be highly irresponsible of us to speculate uh, on inference about COVID. I mean, the science is clear. <laughs> And so McDowell was very nimble. She says, I, I didn't say there was no, I, nor did I say there hasn't been a, a, an outbreak, something like what we'd call COVID. That's not what I said. I said, I disagree with where, what happened with the second wave. I, I have an opinion. On that. So she was quite nimble. Uh, w but here's the disappointment, right? So 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when uh, the um, disaster capitalism came out, I was, oh my God, you know, I mean, with many, many disaffected academics uh, reading uh, nominal outsiders, right? She's a journalist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're looking for wherever you can, you know, to find scrutiny. And so often it is the, it is the outsider. It's the beginner's mind that's, you know, sort of uncorrupted by, you know, these sort of pedantic heuristics and these, you know, how we get captured Dan, right. By, um, mm -hmm academic tropes and and rules and disciplines and it's it's a straight intellectual straitjacket if ever there was one is going into academia and so along comes Naomi Klein as others have Jane Jacobs herself and an outsider kind of savant looking at it as if for the first time and disaster capitalism was revelatory mm. to me mm. maybe mm. not to many others and for some who were very deep into that they were like saw immediately perhaps this was a limited hangout I thought it was very artful the way she handled the in implications of the 9-11 incident, uh, the incident of September 11, 2001, uh, successfully mm. meme forever is 9-11, right? And, yeah. and that, that she, I, right? But then here she is, yeah. you know, all these years later, um, you know, agent smithing, um, you know, the neo du jour. And yeah. it's, it's so depressing. <laughs> it's so depressing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was it uh, Gramsci who talked about uh, organic intellectuals? I believe so. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what she exactly. Yeah. That would be Allison and what I had associated sort of Naomi Klein with. But yeah, not so sure. The fix may have been in a long time ago. Mm. So the, how, how, how do you imagine such You know, such pe people of inquiry, um, you know, are, are in initially rigorous in their approach and radical in their, their delivery are transformed into organic academics. Power. You know, what, what causes that? What's the causation? You mean ossified academics? They start out organic and alive and and they ossify right. and yeah, okay. Well, so Naomi Klein, I don't think ever took a position, uh, but in general, to your point, Matt, I think academia selects for people who are rigid and conservative on the one hand and then others like Dan, who are looking for the looking for the marginal, the divergent, looking for the vector. And when they're very disciplined and diligent, as a winner of Mark Crispin Miller, um, they deploy the disciplines that they that exist, yeah, the vocabularies and the syntaxes that have been legitimated um, against the apparatus, not unlike Neo deployed hacking in his his uh, software language into the matrix system. It, you, it takes a lot of work and discipline and devotion to do that. It's a very, very hard job. Um, and, and it's very hard to pull off and props to guys like Dan and, and Mark, and there are scores of others, but it, it not, it, but it's a tiny proportion within academia that do that. It's tiny proportion. I think it was so, like, uh, Michael Rechtenwald, you know, uh, yeah. Mark Miller's, uh, colleague, previous colleague at NYU, Michael Rechtenwald, uh, was, uh, brave enough to come out and, uh, start naming and defining the phenomena that was, you know, sweeping North America at the time. Yeah. 
and yeah. uh, he's been <clears throat> he's been filtered out of the system. Uh, he he was uh, through being uh, an organic intellectual, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure if he had tenure at the time, but he was a full time professor. Yeah. Uh, he NY. did not have tenure. Uh, he was. Uh, yeah, he was an he itinerant, was he was itinerant yeah. uh, full time, and I don't know to what yeah. extent at NYU or elsewhere if he if he spent part of his time elsewhere. But now he wasn't tenured. Yeah. But he's been he's been on a tear. He's been writing a number of books, and he shows no signs of uh, slowing down or giving in to uh, you know this uh, hideous uh, uh, ideology that is uh, undermining institutions around the world uh, so he's somebody to look at as well very important intellectual who is in no way an organic intellectual yeah so a bit, bit of a Freudian right. slip on my, my part um, when, when I used the word organic previously um, the, po the point I was trying to get at is I mean in that context people like let's look, look for an example without being too um, Uh, exposing, I mean, Noam Chomsky, you know, in his early days, so radical, so right. brilliant. That's a great example. You know, yeah. I, I think I think that's a great example. The table maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, and has been getting pr progressively worse since. I mean, now now he's shilling for the the establishment. So mm -hmm. you know, what well, what what causes that that transformation? What causes a mind like that to you know give up its propensity to be so open system thinking and self-emerging and self-evolving in its inquiry to I think, become so closed <clears throat> and controlled. I think Matthew uh, used a, uh, referenced it with a word of ossification. Yeah. Uh, I think over years, I mean, perhaps one way to explain it is that over the years we become uh, comfortable uh, in our work and uh, we uh, we're paid, you know, we're paid to uh, do this sort of academic work, and we find comfort in it. And uh, the system reinforces uh, this sort of orthodoxy, this you know, orthodox thinking and uh, research. And uh, uh, we find uh, that uh, we can. Uh, we can uh, receive grants, uh, awards. Uh, we can see our, our work published, and uh, we see, receive recognition. And over time, perhaps uh, this sort of uh, uh, power uh, was it uh, sort of like academic cultural capital, right? It uh, it changes us, right? And uh, it compromises uh, our values, uh, yeah, the, our principles, our interest in truth above all things. And I think this goes not just for the uh, social sciences, but also for the for the hard sciences, biology. Well, I, 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 it makes yeah. me think of Einstein, yeah. you know, especially with his relationship with Princeton and Niels Bohr. Um, you know, was, Niels was constantly trying to bring him in line. You know, and ask ask him to behave in, in front of the people that he was being put in front of. Hmm. You know, and I, Einstein was a rock star. You know, he never wore socks. He never cared for the procession. Um, he, even at Princeton, he was pretty much his own own rules and his own man. And he, he never he never seemed to give that up. And hmm. you know, it, it's just interesting to me that you know may, maybe it's just a simple case of personality rather than intent. I think I think that. Chomsky is a particularly interesting profile uh, because of his uh, devotions uh, for his, you know, until, you know, 15 years or so ago, really after 9-11. I mean, Chomsky, Chomsky just shut up, um, you know, at 9-11. Um, and he, 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 he tortured his own canon to extract from it uh, yeah. an argument for uh, pressing... Uh, the incident into a Ptolemaic system uh, of, of, you know, as, as, uh, astronomical patches to make a system that actually was based on a flawed set of presumptions, right? Somehow mm -hmm. fit. And he, he couldn't 
he couldn't make it fit, and he knew he couldn't make it fit. He has too he has too much intellectual integrity to, to to think otherwise. I don't think he ever really deluded himself. But you're Noam Chomsky, and you're bidding being put on the spot. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it, it. What do you do? To Dan's point, you protect your prestige. Um, Chris Hedges was less uh, obscenely that way. I think mm. Chomsky was a court, kind of sort of toed the line of obscene in his denunciations. Um, Chris Hedges, a bit more demure. Uh, but I think of Chris Hedges', is, Chris Hedges you know, stuff on you know, deer hunting with Jesus and how wrong he got it. You know, he thought fascism was going to come to the U.S., wrapped in a flag declaring f freedom or else. In mm. fact, it hasn't arrived that way. It, fascism has arrived yeah. to the U.S. through the precincts of liberal influences. And I, yeah. that's a hard one for me to swallow as a lifetime I'm liberal affiliate, and now I'm a recovering liberal for the rest of my life. I'll never be a conservative, <laughs> but I'm a recovering liberal. And it, it, that's is where fascism has is, is come to us, uh, through the precincts of liberal class and its cultural cachet and everything that I used to dismiss as hysterical and benighted and befuddled and all of, you know, deplorable um, mm. from uh, the conservative and the right. I have, I have been incredibly chagrined to find remarkable prescience mm. and acuity in uh, the capture by major institutions. Um, uh, academia, the press, um, mm. you go on and on uh, by a uh, desiccated, a desiccated outlook that at one time promised the world something with uh, a liberalism so-called, is it more from 19th century to 20th century, but yeah. became utterly captive to Dan's point to a regime set of values that were corporate, militarized, imperialistic through and through. In fact, by Biden has been a fixer his whole career. He's been a fixer. You have to give Biden credit for ever being able to claim he gave two shits for the working person. Um, it, his position on busing, his position, particularly on yeah. race, he's never mm -hmm. done anything for working people that, that held up ever. He may have mm -hmm. postured himself and positioned in some ways, but never did legislation come through under his signature for working people. He certainly, mm -hmm. though, and it's astonishing. You have to give him credit for what a hardcore yeah. racist the man has been under the mantle of, of the Democratic Party nominally claiming to care. And, and then, of all things, to be rolled up under Obama. The perfect mm. laundering for Biden in preparation for 2020 was yeah. uh, uh, 2016 was a dry run, uh, was a, was a um, crowd testing for uh, mistakes he would make and how to clean him up. And 2020 was the real deal. And he needed the laundering of eight years under a black president to cleanse him of his the blight on his record that was so racist. I think that's so, great. Well, you, you have to remember that Biden isn't black. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I mean, that line from B Biden himself uh, is maybe one of the reasons why I find uh, propaganda studies so intriguing and so uh, one of the most important areas of study today because uh, his, his uh, castigation of the, uh, the interviewer that, you know, uh, quote unquote, I'm kind of paraphrasing. Uh, if you don't vote for me, in effect, you're not black. Um, <laughs> right? we, we, we saw that, that in the UK. It's, it's, yeah, it's that, baffling. That, uh, I mean, the, that line, among countless others during these uh, past few years, uh, really, um, I think it illustrates the importance of uh, a couple things. One of them is the, uh, the the vital importance of propaganda studies uh, to as uh, you know concerned citizens we we ought to learn something about the principles of PR public relations and propaganda because the corporate media uh, are the the at least in the United States uh, the corporate media are uh, 
probably the best propagandists on earth uh, to, to have been able to uh, take Biden's uh, sentiments displayed publicly and to spin them in a way that uh, he comes out squeaky clean is a testament to the power of propaganda the system I, 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 I can't agree with you more Dan I mean I, I think I think it's you know pro propaganda is, is certainly one of the disciplines that um, you know can give a myriad of uh, good examples with regards to that particular argument but uh, there's a wider view you know it goes further right? you know, from social technical technical and, and even a societal values um, kind of way and it, we're, we're now living in a world where a majority of view a socially acceptable norm a shared value can mm. be heralded as hate speech you know, yeah. I mean the, yeah. the, the the wokest movement has got to the point now where it is so powerful that you know in, in the UK at least you know, there, there was a, a lady who put up the, the Oxford Dictionary definition of woman on an advertising billboard and was threatened with a jail term over it. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not allowed to define women in such a way. Or, or more to the point, you're not allowed to belittle anyone who doesn't define themselves as a woman in such a way. You know, you're talking about the less than 1% of the population that have a problem yeah. with this kind of socially acceptable behavior Mm. dictating to the 99% of society mm. what is right and what is wrong. You know, and I, I think that's why Biden can get away with saying such things because, right. mm. you know, it's, right. it's not that he feels that he, you know, the, the power that he has or the position that he's in affords him the ability to say such controversial things and get away with it. But, you know, it's playing into the whole degenerative purposeful transformation of this kind of introduction of a non sequitur at a societal level you know, and, and, it's, and I, I believe it's absolutely done on purpose yeah um, it needs to stop it's kind of like it's kind of like brave new world meets 1984 meets they live yeah. yeah i mean how many how many times have you i mean you, you all know my opinion you know i mean um I believe on Facebook people should be more appreciative of things I don't say sometimes. You know, I mean, fa Facebook, I, I don't, I, I can't take it seriously. I mean, it's great fun. Um, it's brilliant in terms of the people that you get to meet and the circles you get to join and the debates you get to have. Um, if you are lucky enough to find yourself in a position where you are with like minded people who can conduct themselves in such an environment. Mm. And then there's the other side of these these platforms, you know. And I think I think we get into trouble with regards to the acceptance of this kind of undermining of society through introductions of non sequiturs, whereby, you know, the the government itself says that oh dear, Facebook it's allowing people to circulate face, fake news. It's because it's taken too seriously, in my view. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I mean, yeah. people who believe wholesale what they see on Facebook shouldn't and i think if that if that expands itself to um a, a place where it can affect enough people to then define what is being perceived as fake news as a as a threat to the reality of the majority then that, so, is that not the very definition of a pathology i have to go on that note uh, bitter by any definition is how i feel for leaving you guys i i'm, I'm <laughs> expected somewhere where someone is hungry and i have to follow through uh, it's been a pleasure guys uh, i hope this gets taped and i can finish it elsewhere well we'll, we'll get on to the election now <laughs> yeah thank you thank you so much matthew can't um, wait guys Daniel. great seeing you matthew take care guys we'll see you cheers right. bye-bye Daniel, do you have a time check for you? Uh, I have a uh, lecture coming up uh, pretty soon, so I'll have to bust out pretty soon. Well, we, we can come back in the morning so I can get some sleep. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's an idea. Hashtag, hashtag just saying. <laughs>
<laughs> so where are we at right now with the um, with the election? Depending on As, who- uh, did, did Biden win New York? Because I, I think that's pretty pretty indicative of what's going on. I mean, I, well, it, it's claiming that he has yes, <sighs> but nineteen percent of the estimated looks like it's uh, one one hundred electoral votes for Trump, one twenty nine for Biden. Which where where are you looking? Because it's different here. I've got ninety two to one thirty one. Oh, um, okay. So I'm. It's interesting the, the differences, and, I, and then another one. I've got fifty four to eighty nine, fifty four on Trump, eighty nine for Biden. Okay. So as 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 an outsider, and you you might giggle a bit when I tell you this, I've always watched C SPAN and PBS. Is that good? It's something. Yeah, it's, it's better. I think it's better than uh, it's better than the uh, uh, corporate behemoth. Yeah, I'm more of a masterpiece theater girl myself, so. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm more of a mystery science theater three thousand kind of guy myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps we, can, uh, perhaps we can. Perhaps we can. Do something uh, after the election. That would be great. Uh, Post mortem. Well, uh, to be to be honest with you, I mean, I think I, I think it's pretty demonstrable that you know, and I, I use the term demonstrable in 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 the context that nobody can prove it. It was like that when I got here, and I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that something's afoot at the Circle K. Uh, and, uh, wow! You know, you have, you have Circle K in uh, the UK. No, I'm just quoting Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Oh, right. okay. Nice, <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah. dude. So I only, um, I only saw it on VHS. <laughs> yes. So you know, so, something's going down in in uh, in the the dark the dark times of New Jersey or whatever the quote is. So. Um, yeah. You know that this is going to go on. I mean, this isn't going to get decided tonight. Um, you know, I, th- I think that the fact that um, the judge circuits from the the fifth to the Supreme Court have been padded out by the Republicans over the last four years is 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 probably a premeditated move by the the grand old party. We got that right. The Republicans are the grand old party. They're, they're the elephant, aren't they? That's yes. right. Yeah, the elephant in the room, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to the the ass. Of American politics, yeah. yeah. So um, th- there you go. Similes abound on systemic frog. So yeah, um, you know this is going to get drawn out. It's going to be a legal fight. There's going to be lawyers involved. I I want to be awake when Trump throws a, a paddy on the balcony about not conceding the election because that's going to be entertaining. <laughs> you know, and I I want to I want to see Biden jumping up and down, going, see see. I told you, I told you, you know, as if they're a, a couple of six-year-olds running around with cowboy hats going, bang, nah, nah, you missed me. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it's going it, to, it's street theater for a Brit, this, this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. H- Hillary cr- crying the last time around was absolutely fantastic. I enjoyed it thoroughly and I wish she'd done it a couple of times, but, um, you, you know, then she went and found herself in the woods. Um, yeah, so that that would be great to uh, do a review of, really, because okay. th- those behaviours are worth picking don't... apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you don't get them in UK politics. You know, the the, U- the UK politicians are so sophisticatedly slimy now. You know, they they've got the NLP down. They've got the hand gestures down. It's almost as a result of military level training and imparting information. And you, you, you don't see that with U S politicians. You know, you can, you can see, you can see their faces making up as they go along and yeah. wanting to behave in a certain fashion, but not quite pulling it off. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's really, it's really quite uh, entertaining for me. So yeah. Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be a shame to miss that, but, to be honest with you, that I don't think is going to happen for at least 12 hours. Mm. Okay. Maybe we can organize something. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, is, is there a, 
channel to watch or a notification to be had with regards to in half an hour they're going to announce the results? I don't know, Don, you're probably more privy to that than I. I, I mean, there is, it's really, you know, right now I'm, I'm toggling through Google, New York Times, um, CNN and a few others. So I don't know that there's a particular channel. I haven't even turned on the, the, the news yet to see. Well, I, I heard from what, what I've been um, following in the last couple of days. Basically, there's, what, six swing states? I'm going to have to cut out. Sorry. All right. Have a good lecture, dude. All right. Thanks, talk to you guys soon. All right. Take care. <laughs> All right. So there's like, there's like six swing states. Cheers, Dan. All right. And, and um, yeah, Trump's, so got, Trump's got the college vote, right? So there was, there was for a brief period of about three, four hours, speculation in the UK that, Trump could get 10 million less votes than Biden and still win. And it all depended on six swing states, which were. We've got Arizona, Nevada, Michigan, Ca Georgia, Florida, Ohio, North, Pennsylvania. North, North Carolina and Ohio. So, North something Carolina, like that. Ohio. Mm -hmm. so, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania right. was the big one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I mean, Pennsylvania has 20 electoral votes. Texas has 38, but Pennsylvania is the um, is right now 17% reporting. It's interesting because we with only 17% reporting, it's it's nearly neck and neck, but it's looking it's swaying towards um, Biden at this point. But the, it's still too early to tell. And then, you know, Arizona is a swing state and they won't even have the first results until nearly 10 Eastern, which is what, 15 minutes from now or so. So, so why, why, why are most Americans um, against the premise of deciding the election based on counting the number of votes that have been cast rather than allowing media organizations to assign a winner from polls? Well, we, we know that polling has been a little bit fraught in the recent past, but I I mean, I think that's above my pay grade. I don't know that I'm qualified to even provide a context or an opinion on this. I mean, if, we, if it's popular vote that we're counting, then I don't think we would have the current president, or I think we would have Gore. Well, that's... That's being caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> I think, I think if, uh, if if Clinton had won the last time round, I mean the, the Chinese have a saying, "May you live in interesting times," and you know I, I thoroughly believe we are. But if Clinton had won, it wouldn't be so interesting. <laughs> interesting as report. report. Interesting as well, sorry. Is a word for it? Word for it? Well, you know, I mean, the thing, the thing about Donald, I think he's a man who wants to be president and can't be. You know, and, and uh, I mean that in, in a myriad of ways. You know, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's pretty self-evident that he doesn't respect the office. And I think you should, because you know a, a, a presidency, if if you're actually in the role, is as much about how you perform as it is about what the guy before you did and what you get to hand off to the next guy. You know, it's it's a uh, it's part tradition, part legacy, part progress. And I think all those things need to be kept in balance. And I think the frustrations that Trump is having is that he's being bottlenecked by those who actually run the USA in such a fashion that, you know, he's bound to have frustrations in terms of not being able to implement what he wants to implement. If we are assuming that what, what he wants to do is both rational, meaningful and benefits anybody apart from himself. Um, you know, so there's that. You know, but it, it, it's also about... You 
you know, the little wins. And I, I think as much as I believe that, well, Donald Trump is, is a sociopath. I don't, I don't think there's, there's much debate about that. But he has, to his credit, managed what seems to be a series of small wins that have been misrepresented in the press. You know, I, I think under somebody like Obama, those that misrepresentation wasn't necessary because he did what he was told in the first place. So, you know, the, the slickness of Obama was something that Obama had signed up for from the start. You know, he knew how to play the game. He knew who he was playing the game with. And I think Trump was certainly aware of the possibility of that game going on. But I think the reality of the situation that he's experienced over the last four years has been a bit of a shock to him. You know, I'm, I'm quite surprised that he wants to be president again, to be honest with you. So whether he wins or loses, I think he'll be happy. Although I think his ego will take a hit if he loses. If he can be seen to be losing for the right reasons, which I feel is going to be his bugbear about the circumstances here. You know, and why he's so bought into the premise of making sure that should he lose, it is quite crystal clear to not only just the US voters, but the world, that he didn't necessarily lose the election. You know, he was ousted from office. You know, I think that's a way out for Donald. And one of the reasons why he hasn't really tried hard the last few weeks. I mean, do you see the 60 Minutes interview? Uh, what it was, yes. Doesn't help. You know, and that could so easily have been avoided. I think he's coming think up he's against coming himself, himself a bit. bit. So I can guess. Yeah. Yeah, but we'll find out in hours, or if not, a couple of days. Now I'm wondering oh. if, um, if we want to regroup and whether it's tomorrow, what's tomorrow or Friday, and take a look at, at a recap or a. Yeah, I don't. I, I think let's do it Friday. Okay. Yeah, I think um, you know to to those still watching, I think uh, it's beneficial to make clear that. We have a good few months of past interloping <laughs> that we're, we're planning to um, edit out into, you know, 10, 15 minute bits covering a vast swathe of topics and interests um, in the hope that we can provide some perspective on what we're about, what we want to try and achieve the drivers behind those actions and you know have a laugh doing it really so uh you know look out for that on our youtube channel systemic frog there are articles being written and that have have been written on our medium page do you call it a page a medium account medium account yes yes uh obviously there's a facebook group I mean, more than 1,500 people in uh, the Facebook group now, 500 people on the page. So the, the page is a little bit more serious and uh, you know, organizationally driven than the group. Uh, so if you are looking for an opportunity to be cathartic or to provide an opinion over anything that you feel needs to be provisioned, please do join the group. Get stuck in. Um yeah, so, you know, there's all that. Um, we're going to try and do a weekly podcast on a Friday. So this has been a bit of a practice run, really, just to make sure the tech works. Seems and to. to get... Yes, it does. I <laughs> quite enjoyed this. Yeah, the backdrop as well. Um, you know, it's a useful little thingy, the tools that we found here. Um, so I'll get it yeah. snappy and a little bit more crisp and um, probably more directed. So I think I think this will be a good, it's a good start. And, um, and I think as, as we talk about the topics and also the, the ways to approach the topics, the critical thinking kind of yeah. questions, you know, getting into that, 
the disseminating the or deciphering about the, the what is propaganda, what it is to be affected by, you know, the the media, real corporate and otherwise, and the ways that we can kind of dive into the topics and get to the true essence of of what's really going on. Yes. Um... The, the reverse panopticon, as it were. Okay. You know, it's um, it's going to be an interesting 2021, that's for sure. If not an interesting week. You know, so we'll get there. It's uh, It's been great to know that this works. You know, and to have all four of us on, albeit briefly. I mean, what we need to figure out really is uh, how to invite guests in. So as we do get better than this, I think it's all about practice, really. Uh, you know, the, the four of us have been um, having the, having a bit of banter on a regular basis for a while now. You know, and translate that into bringing other people in and getting different opinions and perspectives. You know, as things happen on a regular basis, we we'll put it out on podcasts and YouTube, and just put it out there, just so people know that. Uh, well, you know, arguably, we're not as insane as everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if not a little bit sane. You know, common sense is our goal. You know, we will be providing uh, commentary and techniques through our YouTube channel on critical thinking using um, different approaches. For my part, um, I am both trained and practiced in systemic thinking, uh, be it actually systems thinking or soft systems methodology, system dynamics. These are all tools that I use in an organizational context on a daily basis to try and figure stuff out. And what, what I hope to be doing is presenting those techniques um, for the layman to be able to enable them to bracket and make sense of the nonsensical, or what seems to be nonsense. You know, bring a, bring a bit of context, and a bit of surround, and a bit of meaning to stuff that's going on, because, uh, you know, there are a lot of linkages flying around at the moment. It's a very cha chaotic environment. You know, I think that would serve a purpose, as well as being a little bit sarcastic about other stuff. Who knows? <laughs> really great we'll do this again on friday and we'll wrap up for the week and um it'll be interesting the results that we see tonight yeah yeah see if anybody comments give us a thumbs up join the youtube channel yep all right well thanks for facil facilitating don yeah anytime i'll see, see you in a bit bye cheers how do i hang up oh there we go <laughs>